So good morning and welcome to Bite Size Edge. And today I've got the privilege of speaking to Amy Rawlingson. Now, Amy Rawlingson has joined us recently on a number of our NLP practitioner timeline therapy and hypnosis courses um, as part of her mission to learn and continue to learn. Amy is a renowned coach um, and her kind of strap line or her focus is focus on why. She's also a very prolific podcaster herself. So in essence, I might be you know, a slight element of intrepidation speaking to Amy this morning. But please have a listen. I'm sure you'll find it interesting when we dig deeper into why. So, Amy, welcome. It's lovely to speak to you. I feel like I've, well, I have actually only ever seen you the other side of a screen. I think that's where most people only ever see me or <laughs> actually they don't even see me. They just hear me. So. They just hear you. They don't even physically get to see you. I think the first conversation we had was via mobile and then subsequently everything else that you've done with us has been done virtually. It's a, it's kind of, I know you're a, an avid podcaster, but I think it's almost a sign of the times right now, isn't it? That everything is done at the other side of a camera on a laptop somewhere. Well, we make do with what we can. And actually, it's, we've become quite efficient in communicating in a different way. So I, I still think that we will eventually go back to being in person again. I hope we can, we can. But it has actually afforded me many opportunities. And I'm sure I'll share some of those in the duration of this. I can chat. imagine. I can imagine. Do you know, you, you made me think about something. Now, I spoke to a teacher um, yesterday and he was talking about the balancing act between remote learning and classroom based learning and how he hopes and it kind of ties into what you've said there he absolutely hopes that when all children get to being back in physically in the classroom that we embrace their use of technology far more so where previously they're asked to put their mobile phone away we've been encouraging them to use it as a form of communication and that we absolutely flex now in the way that we communicate moving forward which I think is so powerful yeah I mean you know the, from the it's a cone of learning by Dale 1969 was was something that I've referenced quite a few times recently in that when we actually experience it when we do it that's when we remember and recall things so yes bringing more experiential learning into the classroom it's only a good thing and mm. I can't believe it hasn't been done before it's still that old you listen and we we, we teach kind of scenario and I know it's getting much better but it, I'm yeah. hoping that this way things might change yeah it's still slightly draconian isn't it in its approach so Amy I'm really keen to talk to you today so you're Amy from Amy Rawlingson um, so you've got your fabulous brand you're a coach you're a podcaster is there anything else you'd throw into that arena well I think one of the things that I spend my time or life doing as much as I can is helping. And that comes in all forms. So yes, the podcast is definitely a, a form of helping, but I do a lot of, and coaching as well. I do a lot of hearing and that's something that is mostly behind the scenes, but not always. It is quite visible and more so in recent years, I've realized just quite how powerful it can be when you rally the troops and get more people involved. And mm -hmm. delegation has been a big thing. It started out for me, I was a young kid and I used to take people out on the, on the river and coach them as a, a cox. I was also a, a very keen rower. I was actually a national champion, but I, from, I used to coach others and they were adults, young children. But what I love doing is taking visually impaired and blind children onto the river and teaching them how to row. So I've always, and then after that, I used to help out in a local special needs school. And then thereafter, I've done a huge initiative, which was a, the West Cricket Force, which is a, a big kind of changing rooms and ground force initiative organized by the England Cricket Board. And you take that into your local cricket club. And I actually got awarded a, a National Outstanding Service to Cricket Award for that back in 2012. 2012 was a big year because I was also a games maker and I helped to train the games makers for the Olympics. So it's always been part of, of what I do. Mm -hmm. I've been involved in, in helping out on organising committees, whether they be at the school or at local cricket club or the Blackheath Rugby Club. And the most recent initiative was to help organise a fundraising campaign for cardiac risk in the young. So we've, I've been helping out. Unfortunately, we couldn't have the ball last year. We had it the year before, the inaugural mm -hmm. one. 
But yes, volunteering is probably something that I don't necessarily talk about. I just get on and do. Okay, that's fascinating. I, I, outside, of, are you a keen fan of cricket and rugby and sport? Yeah. And stop? I, I grew up in the countryside of Warwickshire and I used to go to sort of Sunday cricket where my dad played and I used to get whisked away to the, all these fabulous little villages all the way around the Cotswolds and, and Warwickshire. And it, it was just so fun. Mm. My, my brother and I would put our bikes in the back of the car. We would disappear off for the day. We'd sometimes sit and watch the cricket. We would have our dog with us and we'd just go on adventures. So I just had that wonderful experience as a young child growing up. And what I love about cricket particularly is that you can bring together people from all ages, all walks of life, and they come together as a, as a team. Mm. And so I wanted very much for my children to experience that. So fortunately, my husband does play cricket. It wasn't his favourite sport, but he did do that. <laughs> he did play when he was younger. And so we brought that into our lives. And then my son has also play, played and he really enjoys it. And so now they actually play on the same team, which is just magic. It's so, it's so fun. But I remember being quite young, somewhere between the ages of eight and 11 and being sort of picked up from school and I was like why am I leaving school early what's going on and I got taken to Edgbaston to watch the England play West Indies as a young child and we used to go up to watch Warwickshire play all the time but that was a special day so yes I've always enjoyed it I just love being outside all day you can take the dog with us we just have a fun family and it's just a great community yeah, yeah, I've, I've got a really good friend who's passionate about cricket, absolutely passionate, and and I think she would probably share some of the sentiments you said there about the community, the almost family feel. Her again, her father, her husband, her son are all keen cricketers, um, so it plays out for sure. You, you when you were talking about rowing, that really made me smile. So some some years ago, I was involved with a outbound come outward bound company up in the Lake District. And uh, one of the things they used to do is get all the people on the course up at 5 a.m. in the morning and out you'd go um, rowing on Lake Windermere. Um, and I would always end up being Cox because I had the loudest voice. But the, there was always there was a little bit of a problem because I know you don't necessarily need to know your left from your right when you're shouting. But I often get my left and right confused and, and I would throw in a few extra instructions and often we would find ourselves turning around and going back in the wrong direction. But there we go. All good fun. Uh, something about that, Pip. Why do we get the left and right confused? Because it's not just you. I do. I know other people do. Glad you said that, by the way, Amy. It's not just me. <laughs> Seven it's billion not. people. It's not just you, Pip. <laughs> it's not at all. It's odd, isn't it? But I, I wonder whether it's almost like pre-programmed. Um, one of the things that, you know, just thinking about that and how the brain works one of the things we've moved house recently, as you know, and there's been a couple of times I've been halfway down the stairs and I've stopped to have a conversation and then I've gone to start again and I've had to consciously think about which foot goes first because I'm out of sync. And it feels misaligned. But initially, that whole process of walking down the stairs, a whole process of shouting, go left, go right, is an unconscious process. So it's interesting to think, what what is it that comes in that potentially knocks that off kilter mm, interesting I, I wonder whether it's something to do with we, we get tortured at the same time maybe we should just spend a whole week doing one and then the left the next left, week left. doing the other <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite sensible good plan so Amy I want to ask you a little bit about about your um your position in the coaching world so I'm just going to frame this slightly. So for me, the, the word coach and coaching, and you'll probably know where I'm going with this, feels like it's been so dramatically diluted um, in, in the sense that um, you, anywhere you turn, there'll be a coach for something or another. And that's not me saying they don't have any merit, because I'm sure they absolutely do, but it feels like it's got bigger and bigger and bigger in that world, in that way. You describe yourself on your website as the life pur- as a life purpose coach. That's pretty dramatic um, in, in a good way. I mean, I stopped and went, wow, you know, life purpose. Help me find it. That would be incredible. Tell me more about that, Amy. Tell me more about that. So it's really interesting because it, it was a, a midlife beginning that I started out on myself. I, I call myself a, a midlife beginner. And what happened was... My husband was working and very stressed in his role. 
And I went back to work and I thought I could alleviate the pressure a bit by sort of helping. I'd been at home raising the children for a long period of time. I went back to work and actually just added to the, the difficulties. And so I decided that I would you know, try something different. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to, for start, refurbish a property that we had. And that was the last week of work that I, I resigned and I was leaving that I saw an ad in a paper. And in that particular ad it was all about auctions how to buy property auctions and I thought oh that's that sounds interesting I'll go along well that ended up in me sort of being upsold to a, a two-day course or a three-day course rather and then a two-year course and as you you know me Pip I don't do things sort of by half I did that two-year course in three months and then yeah. I realized I set myself a date a goal and um, as you are big on goals mm -hmm. so I, I decided that I would retire my husband within three years and everybody came at me and said, no, it's not possible. It's not possible. You know, what are you doing? It's a risky market. You don't know anything. I, I really researched. I really did my homework. And three years later, on the 30th of September, 2019, that was the day that he was going to retire. Did he retire? No. Three days later, on the 3rd of October, he did. So I was three days out. I don't give myself a hard time for that. <laughs> so as a midlife beginner, I... I rallied all the tools I needed. Mm -hmm. I reached out for help. I accumulated a huge amount of knowledge. I had no idea there was anything called self-development out there. I'd been in a bubble of parenting. All the books I'd read were all about healthy eating and healthy parenting and all of that. Because again, you know, I like doing the research of how to do things well. And then I saw that other people were, I call it drifting, existing. And I start, had started living I, because I'd changed the way that we'd changed our lives. Mm. And it was because I realized that there was much more out there. And so shifting that for me, I couldn't help but sort of encourage others. So whilst I was going on that journey, I started to help other people. And I set up a, a women in property mastermind right at the beginning of my journey in January 2017. And it's still going now. So we're just starting our fifth year. There's tw just over 20 women in it. And I wanted to pass along the knowledge as I was learning it. I was like, this is ridiculous. I can't just share all of this. You know, I can't just have this to myself. I need to share it with others. Mm -hmm. And so it was empowering others to be more financially literate. So I never set out to be a coach. I certainly didn't set out to be a life purpose coach. I'd never heard of, of any kind of scenario. But what happened was that people sent that came to me and they said, can you help me? Mm. And I was helping them as I was going. I was like, okay, fine. Yes. And then everybody was saying, well, why aren't you charging for that? So I said, well, why would I, you know, it's, it's, but you've paid for all the accumulated knowledge that you have, and you're making these great strides. Why wouldn't you help others? So then I thought, well, okay, well, let's just give it a go. So I had a few clients. I said, let's just give it a go. See how, and they were achieving great results. And I was like, okay, there's something in this. So then that's how it started. And it, it became, yes, some of it was mentoring, some of it was coaching. And then I realized actually people weren't necessarily coming to help get help for property. They were asking for mindset and life purpose. I'm confused. I'm at a crossroads. I'm in a washing machine. All these sort of, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know what it's supposed to do. How do I find my why? All of these questions mm -hmm. came about and I had experienced all of that. So I... I just help people to bridge that gap between becoming confused and not having direction to finding the clarity and having that direction, which sounds really cliched, but it works. And okay. everybody is very happy working with me in that space. Yeah. Okay. So that I love, I love the idea of a midlife beginner. Yeah. It, it, it's the complete opposite to uh, what a large number of people will potentially think will happen when they get to that midlife moment and that almost that crossroads which is one of the most sought after phrases or, or search phrases in the internet in the new year I'm at a crossroads um so to be able to shift it and change it as in actually you're a midlife beginner is just so phenomenally empowering in itself isn't it so you you, you talked about you know the, the, the purpose element there Within your website, within um, a lot of your podcasts, you, you focus on why. Talk to me about why, what do you, what you mean by the why? So for me and for the people that share their journeys as well, at, of those that feel that they have found a meaning in their lives, mm -hmm. 
it comes down to what really matters and what really matters to them. And often, more, more so than not, it's because they know why they do what they do. And it sounds so simple. And it, it really, and it, a lot of people don't know what they want. And it's quite often the case when you ask someone, you know, what is it that you want in life? They'll list a whole load of things that they don't want. And it's not as simple as just reversing that and saying the opposite. Oh, that's what you do want. It doesn't work like that. So it's, it's drilling down the sort of the core questions, you know, what is it you do and why do you do it? And who are you? And understanding the, the principles behind that and understanding who you want to become and not living the lives of others, but living your own truest life. So it's, it's one of those things that for everybody is different. The answer is different. That's why there is no one solution because we all seek different things and we all want different things in, in ways that they make us happy. And again, that journey is also, you're actually not ever really going to achieve it because it's a lifelong path. So it's about understanding that you're taking yourself on a journey and the journey is, is, the, is the fun bit. What do you are there common themes that you hear from people as to why they find them themselves i love the the, the analogy of i'm in a washing machine um they find themselves in this situation because i i hear it from people amy i hear it from people around me i you know i hear it in general conversation and and sometimes not even sometimes actually the environment we're in right now can go one of two ways it can go in the direction of kind of really helping focus the mind and for others, it descends them spiralling and, and clearly many things in between. Have you noticed any common themes? For me, people who understand their values and are living their life in accordance with their values mm. and are aligned with their values, they are the ones that have more clarity about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Mm. And it's, it's something that, again, it sounds simple because your values are there, even if you don't rec recognize that they're there, they are there. And it's just understanding them and then applying them that makes a difference. And a lot of people don't realize that they, they go to work to work. They don't, they go there to meet their needs and their values. And when they are aligned, that's when things happen in different ways. And, you're and in that's flow. in flow, in flow. Exactly. And I'm not going to quote the fabulous, <laughs> the creator of flow because it's Mahali Misentilali or whatever it is I can't say his name <laughs> but it's fantastic you on again I'm really glad you talked about values there because you quote again on your website not that I've pulled it to pieces <laughs> um, if you if you if you valued your work and you were valued for your work then you're aligned with your why values as you know are something which are absolutely fundamental to everything that I do from an NLP perspective and I know you're joining us for the master practitioner course later this year but well actually not that later this year um where we do an awful lot of work around values have you ever been in a position Amy where you've you've realized that your values are misaligned to what you're doing well, I mean, with hindsight, I can answer that question. At the time, I wouldn't have known that that was what was wrong. And isn't so, key? I, key, it's absolutely it? key. That's that whole lack of awareness. You, you, you get a kind of a guttural physical response to a situation. And it's miss the, 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 the big bit is the gap between that, that sensation and actually what's happening here from a value conflict perspective. And, and that's the biggest thing. And it's, it's people don't recognize that that's what it is. As you say, they just get that feeling or they'll leave a job because they, they don't feel that, you know, they're understood or valued. And, and this is the thing is that people don't always recognize that that's where it's originating from. And once they do and once they understand that throughout life and it's something that I, I will do with with clients is do that sort of journey of life and do the valleys and the troughs of understanding what moments in life they have really enjoyed or they felt they've excelled or or difficulties and obstacles but just to map it all out mm -hmm. you'll start to see it more clearly and you'll recognize that it has been current all the way through and it's only when you look sort of look back with that sort of understanding, do you recognize that it has always been guiding you, mm. but you didn't quite or they have been guiding you. But you didn't quite recognize that that's what it was. 
And, and that's why so many people have these different words. Is, you know, is it your element? Is it your essence? Is it your meaning? Is it your destination, your goals? Or whatever words you choose, it doesn't matter. Mm. It doesn't matter. But it's just understanding what is driving you from your core. So, so what about the, the, the situation where the person feels they are completely stuck? They have to, I, you know, and you can hear it in people's language. I have to do this job in order to earn money, in order to support my family. It's misaligned. I don't like it. I have to do it. Now, you know, when someone talks to you in that sort of language, at, at that moment in time, they're very much in it, completely associated to what's happening to them, from them around them how do you shift their focus sufficiently to be able to see it from a different perspective that they do have an out they do have a, an option it's distraction it, it's sort of removing those sort of very very deep rooted emotions attached to it and just asking them to find moments mm. in their role in their job that they do enjoy and then just showing them how they are linked to their values because once you create those sort of synapses and of connection then they start to recognize that actually you know there are many times that it's okay it's just a few moments that override the rest that yeah. are dominant and I'm not asking everyone to jump ship you know, that, that's not always a practical solution, but it's just finding those those times that they can be more appreciated and also recognize their strengths. Because if when they understand what their strengths are and what they're not enjoying, they could probably actually allocate those roles to other people who would enjoy it. So the, this is where when you're working with a company, if you speak to them about their recruitment and their understanding of their management and leadership and actually the ongoing coaching, and recognizing that the sort of superpowers that you have in an organization, mostly they're hidden and that they're not being unleashed. And it's such a waste of potential because actually when people are enjoying their jobs way, way more than they are, the productivity will go up. So you can have a reshuffle, you know, a bit of a cabinet reshuffle within your organization. And actually you can increase productivity because the recruitment of people is a huge resource for a company. Mm. Uh, in, in, even if you're just a small company, it, you know, the, the time and effort and energy involved, if somebody is 80% linked or, or able to perform in their job that's one day a week that they're not mm -hmm. and that's a huge reduction on your on your work mm -hmm. and that's really powerful isn't it that is really powerful it, and, and I wonder how many um, organizations large and small organizations I've got a few kind of brand names popping into my head right now actually um, work in an arena where they don't take on board that level of information. They don't kind of listen and understand the values involved in working in, in for their organisation and those that are important for to, to be replicated in that role. Um, I've done a lot of work with um, some really cool brands that we can probably think about, such as Google, for instance. I don't mind naming them. So, no, I, I'm happily spout off about them. And they're really quite cool and quite funky in the way that they work. Um, and still there are elements which are slightly misaligned. It's a massive organisation. How do you get around that? How, how can an individual, Amy, take control of it from their perspective um, and, and facilitate for them a little bit of change, recognising what they enjoy as well as what they don't, clearly, but to be able to navigate their way to where they really want to be? What, what would be a real nugget for them? It's a case of when they're going into a role, understanding what the company values are and the vision and if they if they are honestly not aligned with that then it's going to be a struggle they are going to be in conflict mm. and it's not something that is going to be a natural fit a lot of people think that the money will uh, and the perks and the benefits will override those they won't they're, they're very short-lived those extras because actually fulfillment is found in when you're doing fulfilling work mm -hmm. so and that can be on a paid or an unpaid basis so really I, I would be just assessing right from the start, right from the go, that are they going to have their needs and their values met at that point? And there are companies that are very current with this, very aware of, of what their values are. Patagonia is one of the best companies to understand its vision and its mission and translate that all the way through the organization. But not all companies are. A lot of it do, do them as a, a tick box exercise. Yeah. So I, I would be, you know, for, for the individual to have some power, 
it's about asking those questions early on mm. and asking, you know, is it just a tick box exercise or is it something that you really adopt and how can I ensure that that's going to be embraced all the way through my journey with you as a company? Mm. And, and, you know, that all brings me back to almost self-value, um, uh, enabling people to have that level. It's really interesting. We're doing a, 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 our kind of videos and, and things for, for this month all around self-love um, and the whole purpose of unless you can love yourself, then actually your ability to love others and things around you is going to be impaired. It's similar, isn't it? So it, this is around having having value. I value myself sufficiently to want to get myself to a place where whatever that might look like, um, which brings me back to. So tell me about the relationship between the why, the value, um, your midlife beginner and clearly your passion, my word, your passion for having or still helping others. You talked about the work you did with teaching um, children to row. You talked about helping out in an SEN school, those sorts of things. What's the narrative that runs through all of that? Because there's a, there's a theme there, isn't there, Amy? For me, it's about, as you say, self-love and self-awareness and taking control and responsibility for yourself. So for me, it was understanding that life wasn't happening to me, that I actually had the ability to create my own and carve my own life. Mm -hmm. And who you are and what you do and what you have is all within your control. And what you want to have determines who you become and what you do. So I ask people, if, if, are you living or are you existing? It, it comes down to it comes down to a really simple sort of yes no binary answer, and I'm reading a book at the moment called Untamed by Glenn and Doyle. I don't know if you've heard of it. Glenn and Doyle, yeah. Oh, yeah, fa- it's a fabulous book. And again, it comes down to being true to yourself mm. and you know, really understanding who you are and yeah. what difference you can make. And for me, I was I was living a life which I. I you know, I've done some great things, but it wasn't ever enough. And I always sort of thought, what is it I could do between 10 and two when I had the kids were little? That was, you know, you know the, there must be more to, to, to life than, you know, just getting some admin bits done and, and I don't know, baking or whatever I was doing for all those years. <laughs> and, and I it was I didn't realize that this whole world was out there. So now I'm just on this curious exploration to achieve as much as I can and understand how I can create a ripple effect so it does come down to it's never too late to be what you might have been that's so important that is so important yeah and I'm not done (laughs) I'm not done The, the, the ability to create the podcast focus on why was that whole conversation, who am I to do so? And then it's sort of like, who am I not to, you know, I'm sitting on this little little old lady, you know, in the middle of of the country, just in the middle of lockdown thinking, what can I do with my time? How will this actually be of use or or benefit to others? Well, you know, I proved myself wrong and I I had an inkling that that would be the case and which is why I went with it. And it's been incredible what people have done as a result. So tell me, tell me, Amy, how many countries are you in? Our last last checked, it was 77. 77 countries. <laughs> oh, my word. That's phenomenal. And how long have you had it, had the podcast going? So I had the idea. I woke up with the idea on the 1st of April. This is the power of the subconscious because I had to. I gave myself the, the goal or the challenge. I had a former business and that business was going to go online with my business partner. And he decided that he didn't want to do it anymore. This is right at the beginning of lockdown. So what happened was I, we were doing the closeout episode on that on that previous podcast and I wanted to have somewhere to direct my listeners mm. saying don't panic you know that you can still tune in this is where you're going to going to be so I had a week and I woke up on that morning of recording with focus on why so my subconscious worked very well for yeah, me and for you. and within 28 days it was launched that's brilliant so where can people find you Amy well, look, you've mentioned the website. So, yes, let's go to amyrowlinson.com. It's really easy. Everything's there. All the oh, links to my social media. It's so easy to find your way around. It's really self explanatory. So, thank you okay. for that. That made, I really enjoyed going through it. And, aha, I'm going to pull out on this bit here. And where can we find you for your, for your podcast, which is Focus on Why? 
It's on all platforms. So if you type in Focus on Why, you will find it on whichever app you use. And yeah, I mean, it's it's there. It's 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 super easy to, to adopt there. You'll enjoy it. And if you do enjoy it, please leave me a five star review. Thank you. Absolutely fabulous. And, and finally, on your on your website, also, you offer a, a 20 minute, almost like a discovery conversation to see whether there's a good fit there. From what I would say for those, you know, those of you listening, what I what I know of Amy through the time I've had working with you, which has been phenomenal. Um, and do you know what? I've learned a lot from you. I really have through that time, Amy. So I appreciate that you're extraordinarily giving with your knowledge. Um, and that in itself, I think, demonstrates a very clear value um, and one that I think many people will gravitate towards. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And thank, oh, thank you. For you. Your, you're very welcome. And thank you for your time today, Amy. It's been lovely um, to speak to you. Um, have you got a podcast that you're doing today? Well, no, but I just wanted to um, say thank you. Uh, as an edgeite, I know that's what we're Yay. called. <laughs> I, I would like to say thank you for your time and for Jules's time, because the courses that I've been on so far, I've been on the NLP practitioner and I've been on the master practitioner for timeline therapy and hypnosis have been incredible. And as you, you mentioned, I am going on to do my master's. So if anybody's out there and they want to investigate the world of NLP, then I couldn't think of a better place to investigate it with than with Pip and Jules. Thank you, Amy. Have a lovely rest of the day. I think we're moving into the weekend. Not Mine all tends to be one of the same thing, to be honest. Um, but have a lovely rest of the day and I look forward to speaking to you very soon. And that was Amy Rawlingson. So she said you can find her at www.amyrawlingson or search any platform for Focus on Why. Thank you for joining us at Bite Size Edge. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes and many other podcast platforms. Looking forward to speaking to you soon.